Well, good morning, church. Man, I'm really excited to be here with you for another virtual service. I've said this a couple of different times, but I'm really excited for us to be back together again physically. That that will be happening soon. But in the meantime, for me and my family, these virtual services have been really helpful for us. It's been a lot of fun for our family to get together in the basements where we normally watch these. And I've loved having Charlotte and Teddy able to see Kate and I singing praises to King Jesus. I've, I've loved getting to answer questions that the kids have in the sermon. I've loved when the sermon gets too long, kicking the kids out to the backyard so Kate and I can watch the end of it. I've loved these virtual services. And we get to be in one more this week. But this week is a special one because we are kicking off a brand new series that we're calling Redemption. And you guys, I am really excited for this series. We actually had it earmarked for the fall, but we moved it to to right now because I'm excited to see what God's going to do as we spend some time in the book of Ruth and then we spend some time looking at the life of Peter. Here's the idea of the series. We've spent the last four and a half months hearing the Apostle Paul preach gospel truth after gospel truth to us over and over and over again. He's been pointing us to the goodness of the good news of the gospel. Now we're going to spend some time thinking about how that good news impacts and influences our actual lives by looking at two biblical lives. You see, I don't know if you know this. This might just be pastor nerd talk. There are basically two ways you can approach sermons out there. One way to approach sermon, there was a famous pastor who used to say, if you want to have a good sermon, figure out what your, your congregation is feeling Find some verses in the Bible that speak to what they're feeling. Make three alliterative points, and then you're good to go. So if your congregation's feeling anxious, go through your Bible. Find a couple of probably out-of-context verses that speak to anxiety. Make three points, and then you're good to go. But here's the problem with that approach. If you're only dealing at the surface level with things that we feel that we need, you're going to miss so much of the beauty of what God has given us in his word. On the other side of the spectrum, I was reading a book this week where a guy said, listen, I don't even care about culture. I don't care about movies. I don't care about felt needs. I just want to bring people into the mind of Christ. Here's the problem with that. We watch movies and we live in a culture and we have felt needs. In fact, if you read your Bible, what you'll find is that the Bible is constantly trying to meet us in the midst of our actual lives. So we as a church, we've chosen a third way. You've felt it throughout the last several months, I'm sure. Our approach as a church is we want to talk about and think about and preach God's word. We want to talk about, think about, and preach the good news of the gospel, which is right at the center of all of God's word. And then we want to see how God's word and the gospel impact and influence our actual life. You see, God is not just interested in our Sunday selves. God is interested in the Justin who lives on Wednesday morning and Thursday afternoon and Friday night as well. That's what our series is going to talk about. How does the gospel, how does the good news that we've spent the last four and a half months just soaking in, how does that impact and influence our actual lives? We're going to see how it does by seeing how it impacted and influenced the lives of an entire family in the book of Ruth. And then we're going to see how it impacts and influences our lives as, it, as we see it impact and influence the life of this guy, Peter, a fisherman from Hicksville, Israel. And not to spoil the ending, we're going to see over the course of this series that, friends, the gospel It sends wave after wave of goodness and grace into our lives. We're going to see that God, through the gospel, brings us hope in the face of suffering. God, through the gospel, brings us freedom in the midst of what would have otherwise been slavery. We're going to see that God, through the gospel, brings us grace in the face of shame. We're going to see that God through the gospel brings us moral strength in the face of temptation. We're going to see that God through the gospel changes entire family trees. Most of all, we're going to see that God through the gospel gives us himself, a good and gracious God right at the middle of our lives. So I'm going to pray in a second, then we're going to jump right into the beginning of this series. We're going to start by looking at the book of Ruth, and we're going to jump into Ruth 1 today. Go ahead and pray with me. Jesus, we love you. And God, we do ask, once again, that you'd meet us. God, that 
in the midst of being in our, uh, our living rooms, our basements, sitting in front of our computer screen with maybe a couple of other families in the house. God, I pray that you would uniquely speak to our hearts. You'd uniquely speak to us in this time. God, I pray that you'd show us how this 3,000-year-old book in the Old Testament is uniquely relevant for us in 2020. We love you, Jesus. We thank you that you consistently challenge and encourage us as we spend time in your word. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Husbands, I want you to take some time and reminisce about that time when you realized that the woman you would marry, your wife, was the one. Think about the time when you realized that the woman that you would eventually marry was the one that you wanted to ask to spend the rest of your life with. We, some of you have to think maybe a bit farther back than others of us, but the moment that most guys realize that they want to ask a woman to spend the rest of her life with him, they'll do at least three things. The first thing that that guy will do is he'll get his, all of his knuckleheaded friends around him and he'll ask, hey, listen, am, am I crazy to want to spend my life with this woman? And at least one of those guys will say, yeah, you are, not because he is crazy, but because, you know, another one bites the dust. He doesn't want to lose a buddy. Then the second thing you'll always do is you'll set up an appointment with dad. You'll sit in that, in that living room cleaning his gun as you ask him if he'll give you his daughter's hand in marriage. And then worst of all, every guy, as soon as he realizes that he wants to spend his life with a woman, will gather together all of his savings and he'll go into the jewelry store. Now, this is terrible because I think the moment that a young male steps into a jewelry store, it is like every salesman in that store, store smells blood in the water. They're all excited to get into your presence, and they come and they begin talking to you about the four C's and how if there's an inclusion in the diamond, it'll mean an inclusion of unhappiness in your future wife's heart. I remember I was having this discussion with the salesman when I was buying Kate's ring, and some younger salesman sideswiped me with a, a platter of water watches because I need to buy a watch for myself as I'm buying an engagement ring for my future wife. And then finally, after that whole discussion, the salesman will ask, hey, what's your budget? You'll tell them it's probably lower than he was hoping. And no matter what you tell the salesman, he'll always bring out a diamond that costs 10% more than your budget, and he'll bring out a black cloth. He'll place the black cloth on top of the glass case, and he'll place the diamond on top of the black cloth. Now, the reason the salesman does it is because he knows that when you place that diamond on top of that black cloth, the diamond is going to shine in all of its glory. In fact, if you're sitting with your family right now, if you're, if you're a kid listening to this, I'd love for you to hop on your mom's lap and look at the, the engagement ring that she has on her finger right now. I can guarantee you that your dad bought that engagement ring for your mom because he saw the diamond shining on the black cloth. Now, here's why I say all that. This morning, the writer of Ruth is going to show us the black cloth that sits underneath the lives of this family, Elimelech, Naomi, and their sons. And the writer of Ruth is going to show us this black cloth that sits under the life, lives of, these, of this family because when later in Ruth he shows us the glory of God's redemption for this family, it is going to shine all the more brightly. Let's read about the black cloth this morning because we're going to see as you place diamond after diamond in the book of Ruth on top of this black cloth, we're going to see the glory of God's redemption shine all the more brightly. Read with me if you have your Bibles. We're going to start in Ruth 1, verse 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab. He and his wife and his two sons, the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. They were Ephrahites from Bethlehem and Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of one was Orpha. The name of the other was Ruth. They lived there about 10 years, and both Malon and Chilion died also, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. 
Now, as we read these opening verses in Ruth, I want you to notice three components of the black cloth that sits underneath the lives of this family. First, there's a depraved culture here. Anybody remember having to read books for high school English? Isn't that just the best? If you had an English teacher more than, who was good, more than likely you had to read Huckleberry Finn, probably the most important American novel. Michaela Palmer and I can fight about that later. You would also probably had to read The Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne. That was my personal favorite in high school, still one of my favorite novels. And more than likely, if you had a really good English professor, at some point you'd have to read something by Ernest Hemingway. This is for free, but if you've never read The Old Man in the Sea, go ahead and pick it up at some point or on your ebook reader device and spend an afternoon reading The Old Man in the Sea. It's unbelievable. And part of the reason that you read these different books is that they represent different historical periods in our country's history. And because they represent different historical periods, they approach their novels, their language differently. So if you read The Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne, you'll see all of this flowery language, these long sentences, these big words that nobody uses these days unless they want to seem super smart. But then if you flip over and read Ernest Hemingway, you'll see the exact opposite. It's all of these short words, short, punchy sentences. But if you're willing to slow down and think about what Ernest Hemingway is saying, you'll see that underneath every one of these sentences, there's all this meaning and all of this emotion. You see, Ernest Hemingway very famously forces us to read between the lines if we're going to understand what he's trying to communicate to us. The Bible is very similar, especially in the Old Testament. Over and over again in the Old Testament, especially the narratives, you'll find that the Bible forces us to slow down and read between the lines. So, for example, if you're reading through Genesis at some point, my discipleship group is reading through Genesis, you'll get to a part where this guy Jacob has four wives, Rachel, Leah, Rachel's maidservant, and Leah's maidservant. And at no point in the narrative does Moses stop and say, that's a sin. One man, one woman, one lifetime, that's God's ideal. At no point does does Moses say that, but he makes it very obvious. How? Well, if you read the story, Jacob's family is a hot mess deserving a Jerry Springer episode from the late 90s, proving that you should never have four wives. The same sort of dynamic is happening in Ruth. There's seemingly unimportant phrases right at the beginning here that are jam-packed with meaning and with importance. One of those seemingly unimportant phrases is the first one in our book. The writer of Ruth says, in the time when the judges ruled. Now, you need to know some things about when the judges ruled if you're going to understand what's happening here. Judges, the book right before Ruth, portrays the time when the judges ruled. And what it portrays in the book is that the time when the judges ruled was a downward cycle of sin. You see, God, in the second book of the Old Testament, Exodus, miraculously delivers his people from slavery to the single greatest superpower of the day. He quite literally redeems his people from slavery in Egypt. In Leviticus and Numbers, the third and fourth books of your Bible, what you find is that God is with his people as they're walking through the wilderness, and he institutes a way for his people to regularly meet with him and to regularly receive grace from him. That's the point of the temple sacrificial system. In Deuteronomy, the fifth book of the Old Testament, Moses, the leader of the people, gives a final sermon to his people before, to God's people, before they enter into the promised land. And the theme of the sermon is quite simple. Moses challenges the people of God to be faithful to God in the same way that God has been faithful to them. In Joshua, God miraculously provides the land that he had promised to his people, but then Judges happens. And what we see in Judges is this repeated cycle. The people of God turn their back on God. God sends usually a foreign army into the promised land to to get his people's attention and to draw them back to himself. The people see this foreign army coming in. They cry out to God. God delivers the people through a hero, a judge. And then almost immediately after they're delivered, the people of God, they forget what God has done for them. And the process repeats over and over and over again. But as this process of sin repentance, deliverance, and forgetting happens over and over and over again for God's people in Israel, the culture at large goes from bad to worse to worse. 
This is obvious from the judges that God provides for his people. This is obvious from the the judges that God provides for his people. The first judge that God provides for his people is this guy, Othniel. There's a pastor who says that Othniel was a a cookie-cutter, clean-cut hero. He was the kind of guy that had no issues with his character. He lived above reproach. The second judge that God provides for his people is Ehud, who was just as clean-cut, just as squeaky clean, but left-handed. And listen, I'm like you. I don't trust anybody who's left-handed. Like, why can't you write with the normal hand? That's Ehud. He's a good guy, just left-handed. But progressively, each judge in Judges gets a little bit more morally suspicious and then a little bit more morally suspicious until you get to the final judge whose name is Samson. And Samson, if you don't know his story, is a hot mess. My kids and I, we went down to the Branson Sight and Sound Theater to watch the Samson show. I think this was last spring. And we got back from the show, and my son Teddy, he took off his shirt, and he began carrying around a a fold-up chair, like one of those metal fold-up chairs, around our front yard, lifting it above his head and yelling to our neighborhood, I'm Samson. And his pastor dad kept wanting to say, listen, buddy, that's not the character you want to be in the Bible. Samson was a hot mess, but it gets even worse. If you read Judges 19, 20, and 21, you'll find maybe the most morally repugnant scene in the entire Bible. I'll spare you the details because many of you are with your family. And then at the very end of Judges, this is the final verse in Judges right before Ruth happens. It says this, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Now, that was true of Israel, but I wonder how fitting that assessment of culture is for our culture. These are the days when the judges ruled, and they were dark and depraved days. It is a black cloth sitting underneath the lives of this family, Elimelech and his family. The depraved culture was a black cloth sitting underneath the life of Elimelech and his family. But listen, every culture in the history of the world has been filled with fallen people. So every culture in the history of the world has had its own places of depravity. I mean, look at how our culture approaches sexuality or how our culture approaches money or comfort or vacations or self-centeredness. There is a black cloth of depraved culture underneath our lives as well. Second, there is shameful sin right at the beginning of this book of Ruth. Look at the next phrase in Ruth. The writer of Ruth says, there was a famine in the land. Now, if you've read the Old Testament, that should automatically perk your ears up. Because one of the things you'll find in the Old Testament, and oh, by the way, in the New Testament too, is that God is consistently using natural phenomenon, even natural disasters, for his own sovereign purposes. In Genesis, God uses a famine to make Joseph the number two in Egypt, and he uses a famine, to that same famine, to get Jacob and the 11 other of his sons into Goshen where God would bless them. Even more relevant, in Deuteronomy, God through Moses tells his people that, listen, if you stop following me, if you don't remain faithful to me, I will send curses into the land so that you might, I might get your attention and I might draw you back to myself. And one of the curses that God says he might send into the land is a famine. So the moment that a famine hits the land, any faithful Israelite should have his ears perked up. And any faithful Israelite should be searching his own heart and wondering, hey, is there sin that I need to repent of or our people needs to repent of? If you were living in Israel in a famine, the first thing you should do when a famine hits is to search your heart. Is there something that I need to repent of or the people need to repent of? Elimelech, he doesn't do that. He doesn't search his heart. In fact, he runs. And in our passage, you need to know it matters where Elimelech runs from. He runs from Bethlehem. He runs from land that God has promised to his people. To live in the land in the Old Testament was to live under God's protection. It was to trust God. But Elimelech makes a choice. He can endure the pain of living in the land but still having a relationship with God. Or he can avoid pain but also avoid a relationship with God. 
He has a choice. Am I going to stay and remain in relationship with God, even though it might be physically painful? Or am I going to avoid pain, but also avoid relationship with God? To be honest, many of us in our own lives, we're faced with that choice from time to time. Elimelech runs from the presence of God, but it also matters where Elimelech runs to. He runs to Moab. The Moabites were a product of an incestuous relationship between Lot and one of his daughters at the beginning of Genesis. And by the time the judges rolled around, the the people of Moab were one of the greatest enemies of the Israelite people. In fact, that guy Ehud, the left-handed judge, he delivers God's people from Eglon, an overweight Moabite king. Even worse, the Moabites are famous for worshiping a god named Chemosh. We find out in 1 Kings that Chemosh, one of the things he required from people, this false god, was that these people would sacrifice their children to him. So Elimelech, follow this, he runs to physical safety in Moab. There's probably food there. But in the process, he takes his family to maybe the most spiritually dangerous place possible. I hear about people relocating all the time and we often relocate for any number of reasons i wonder if we consider whether we're going to a place that is spiritually advantageous for us and our family elimelech does not think about that he goes to a spiritually dangerous place and then the sin compounds it gets even worse elimelech he stays there says right at the beginning of verse 2 that, that Elimelech was, uh, was sojourning in the land. But then at the end of verse 2, we find out that he stays there. They went into the country of Moab and stayed there. What we're seeing is compounding sin. It starts off as a little compromise, but then it compounds on top of itself. You see, the culture in Israel at this point was a hot mess. But then Elimelech's sin compounds everything. He takes his family away from the one true God. He takes his family to a place that worships a false God that demands false child sacrifices. And then he stays there. It is dark and depraved sin. On top of dark and depraved sin, it is a black cloth sitting underneath Elimelech and his family. Now, before we move on, it, this was, this sin was a black cloth for Elimelech and his family. But we can see the black cloth of sin sitting underneath our lives as well, can't we? In the midst of the anxiety of a global pandemic, we way too quickly, just like Elimelech, run from the presence of God. We self-medicate with with Netflix or substances or Amazon online shopping or endless social media scrolling. And rather than searching our own hearts and asking the question that Elimelech should have asked, which is, is there something in this season that I need to repent of? Is there something in this season that we need to repent of? Rather than doing what Elimelech should have done, which is running into the presence of God, we run away from the presence of God. And way too often we run to things that might make us feel physically better, but leave us spiritually starved. Listen, I love watching episodes of various comedies on Netflix as much as the next guy. But if that's the only thing we're doing with our free time in the middle of a pandemic, I'm worried that we're going to leave this season spiritually famished. And then way too often, we stay there. We're right in the middle of experiencing a -a once-in-a-lifetime season. This pandemic has ground everything to a halt And I'm worried, we'll talk about this on Wednesday in our God and pandemic equipping opportunity. I'm worried that way too many of us are going to leave this pandemic season unchanged. Or worse, addicted to any number of things that we've used to self-medicate in this season. There's a black cloth of sin sitting underneath our lives too. Third, there is real suffering in this story. This is almost too difficult, too tragic to imagine. In this culture, the primary source of safety and stability for any woman would have been her husband. The primary source of safety and stability would have been the protection of her husband. But Elimelech dies, leaving Naomi vulnerable. Any woman in this culture, certainly any widow in this culture, certainly any widow in a foreign land would have been incredibly vulnerable with her husband dying. 
It, there is no 401ks in this culture. If you wanted to have any hope for your future, you need to have hope in your sons. If you wanted to have any hope that you would have any type of income when you got old, it was, it was hope that your sons would provide for you. And in fact, Naomi was likely protected by her sons for a season of time. But then not only does Elimelech die, but her two sons die as well. Listen, losing a husband and two sons, it is tragic in any cultural moment. But in this cultural moment, it would have been unimaginably tragic. This is real suffering, full stop. It's a black cloth that sits underneath the, the lives in this family. Real suffering was a black cloth for Naomi and cards on the table. One of the things that COVID-19 has shown us is that suffering can knock on our door at any time. Some of us are suffering right now. I've, I've answered those phone calls. I don't want to be a downer. Some of us will suffer at some point in the coming months. Even worse than that, no matter how many cans we have in our little storm shelter, we can't guarantee that we're not going to experience suffering in this fallen world. There is the black cloth of real suffering that sits underneath our lives as well. The writer of Ruth, right at the beginning of this letter, right at the beginning of this story, has shown us a black cloth. Now, what are we supposed to do with that? Like, do we all just need to go to Andy's, get a whole bunch of frozen custard, sit in our basement, turn the lights off, and cry ourselves to sleep at 3 o'clock this afternoon? I don't think so. I think there are at least three pieces of good news underneath this black cloth that we've just seen at the beginning of Ruth. The first is there's something strangely encouraging about seeing how relevant this 3,000-year-old story is for us. Have you noticed that some of what Naomi and Ruth have walked through, some of what Naomi and Ruth will walk through in this story is strikingly similar to what you and I live on a day-to-day -day basis. We know what it's like to live in a culture at different levels that is very antagonistic toward following the one true God. You and I know what it looks like to have to sit and face the shame of our sin. You and I know, most of us, what it's looked like to walk step by step through suffering. And the same sovereign and gracious God that's going to meet Naomi and Ruth every step along the way in this story is going to meet us every step of, along the way in our lives as well. The second piece of good news is I would suggest that the way that the writer of Ruth has presented the human condition should be comforting to us. Friends, we see the blackest of black cloths right at the beginning of Ruth. We see that black cloth, and whether or not we realize it, we have a similar black cloth underneath our lives. Isn't that strangely comforting? God doesn't deny the existence of real difficulty from time to time in our lives. God doesn't deny the existence of a black cloth under our lives. Christianity doesn't try to deny that suffering and pain are real. Christianity doesn't try to deny that the rabbit hole of our sin goes deep and some of us have ended up in places that we never in a thousand years thought that we would be. Christianity doesn't try to deny that there is real evil at work in our world. Isn't it comforting that Christian, Christianity is honest with us about the human condition? See, from cover to cover, God's call for us, I would even say it more strongly, from cover to cover, God's command for his people is that we would be as honest with each other as he is with us. God's command for his people is that we would be honest with each other, as honest with each other as God in his Bible is with us. You see, in Christian community, it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to struggle from time to time and to not have everything figured out. In fact, one of the ways that God often changes us, transforms our lives, is as we are honest with people around us about the black cloth that sits underneath our lives, and we see somebody sitting across the table from us, looking us in the eye and saying, yeah, me too. I've got a black cloth there as well. I know it's hard to be honest about places that we struggle. I know it's hard to swallow your pride and admit that there are places of weakness but I have to ask the question, where do you need to let people see the black cloth in your life? If you wanted to share about some of the places that you're struggling, do you have a community 
where you could do that. It's part of why our life groups meet week in and week out. Friends, God's word is clear from cover to cover. The human condition is a black cloth. God's word doesn't deny it. It doesn't soft pedal it. God loves us enough to speak honestly with us. And then third, God loves us enough to place diamond after diamond after diamond right on top of the black cloth so that those diamonds shine out in all their glory. So question, where is the diamond in our story? I would submit to you that the rest of the book of Ruth is intended to show us diamonds of God's redemption on top of this black cloth. But we get a little bit of a preview in the first three words of verse 6. Read this with me. Then, verse 6 of Ruth 1, then she arose. Friends, in our passage, Naomi has felt the full-throated reality of the blackness of of the black cloth, and then she arose. If you've ever walked through real suffering, you know that those three words are nothing short of miraculous. And as we spend the next six weeks following in the footsteps of Naomi, we're going to see God drop diamond of his redemption after diamond of his redemption on top of the black cloth that sits underneath Naomi and her family's story. You see, in the first part of this redemption series, as we walk through the book of Ruth, we are going to see the diamond of biblical femininity shining forth. You see, in every season of human history, God has transformed and raised up strong female leaders to transform their families and to transform their culture. We're going to see exactly that kind of leadership in the person of Ruth. In the first part of this redemption series, we're going to see the diamond of biblical masculinity shining forth. In every season of human history, God has transformed and raised up masculine leaders who will transform their families and their culture. We're going to see exactly that type of leadership in the person of Boaz. In the first part of this redemption series, as we walk through Ruth, we're going to see the diamond of family trees transformed. In every era of human history, God has found families who are willing to say, as for me and my house, we will follow the Lord. And then he's used those families to quite literally change the entire world. Naomi's family will change the world in the book of Ruth. In the first part of this redemption series, we're going to see that God can bring those who seem farthest from him to himself. Ruth is a part of one of the biggest enemies of the people of Israel. More than likely, she worshipped at the Chemosh temple. But God lovingly and graciously brings her into the family line, think about this, of the Savior of the world. I know that some of you this morning feel very far from God, but know this. The God of the universe is in the business of bringing those who are very far from him back to himself. And most of all, the biggest diamond of all, God places himself right in the middle of the black cloth. In this book of Ruth, we are going to see a covenant, we'll define that, a covenant God full of faithfulness and goodness for his people show up over and over and over again in the midst of some of the darkest circumstances. Friends, the black cloth is real for Naomi and Ruth, for us as well. But God is going to bring us good news in this little book. He's going to lift our eyes and challenge us, even in this season, to dare to hope that the same sovereign God who moves with grace and goodness in the midst of Naomi and Ruth, that that same sovereign God might move with grace and goodness in our lives in 2020 as well. In fact, we have even more reason to dare to hope than Naomi and Ruth do. We know something that they don't when your identity is found in the rock-solid foundation of Jesus and what he's done for you. You can have hope in the darkest of circumstances because we know that our Savior walked through the darkest of circumstances to bring us to himself. Let me pray. Jesus, we love you. And God, I don't know how this is landing on my friends, but God, I pray most of all that the beginning of 
the book of Ruth would give us the freedom, maybe the permission, to be honest about some of the places that we're struggling. God, I pray that we'd be honest in our community with some of the places that we're struggling, with our life group friends, with our discipleship group friends. God, that we would be honest about some of where the black cloth lies in our lives. And then, God, I pray for my friends that we would, as we're even transitioning, hopefully increasingly out of this pandemic, God, that we would dare to hope that the same sovereign God who shows up with grace and mercy to Naomi and Ruth over and over again might also be showing up in our lives in this season as well. We love you, King Jesus. Meet us as we walk through Ruth and then as we look at the life of Peter over the coming months. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.